What do a fat priest, a tall king, and a prophet with crazy hair have in common? Oh yeah, they're all found in the book of 1 Samuel. There's also some rats and some tumors as well. Welcome to Daily Gospel, equipping you to know God through His Word and His Son, Jesus Christ. My name is Keith, this is Brandon, and we are pastors at Gospel Community Church here in Santa Cruz, California. Welcome, like, subscribe, comment, all the good stuff so we get the word of the gospel out. Brandon, what are we talking about today? We're talking about the book of 1 Samuel, Mm. the story of King Saul, I guess the rise of of King Saul. Rise and fall. Well, not the fall yet. Yeah. Well, I guess a little bit of the fall. (laughs) But the fall is a long and rocky journey, so. Yeah, he dies. He does die. No. Yeah. Spoiler. Yeah. yeah. You kind of want him to die in the end. I mean, it's been it's been a couple thousand years, so I guess the spoilers at this point are irrelevant. Yeah. Well, a lot of people still haven't read the Bible, though. So that's true. That's true. Yeah. This is a great, it's a great, great book. It's a great, very important book in the development of of the history of Israel. We see Saul, who's sort of a foil for David, mm-hmm. right? The, the true king. Saul is sort of the imposter. Yeah, because the book of Ruth actually ends with David, not Saul, and then all of a sudden we're like, oh. Well, where's David? Samuel and Saul and what the heck's going on here? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. So we saw the Book of Judges, Book of Joshua. We've seen this developing theme of the need for a king. Mm-hmm. Judges is chaos. It's the enemies of, of Israel dominating them. It's uh, leaders that are immoral. Mm-hmm. It's and then of course just rampant wickedness. So Judges is sort of the big picture of what's happening at that time. Ruth is the close up. Right, slows down to this mundane story of of one family mm-hmm. and how God is working redemption through their story. So right. we saw the tragedy that happens to Naomi. She's been disobedient. She's left the promised land, and she ends up losing her family, hmm. all except for her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And through that story, God brings a redeemer, Boaz, who marries Ruth uh, and redeems not only the land that, that was lost, not only the name of her deceased husband, but really... This, the story of God. I mean, there's a, a, a this is a big turning point in God's story, oh, yeah. which is that God's going to use Ruth to bring along King David. Hmm. So that's where we ended up at the end of Ruth, was seeing the end of that, which points to David himself. Right. And that's then a, we get to 1 Samuel. Yeah, exactly. So um, some big points. What's this about? I mean, you talked about a couple of them, I guess. But Yeah, so the 1 Samuel is all about the tragedy of Saul, right, mm-hmm. and and the, the rise of King David. Right. And 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel really are just one coherent story. They're one, they're one book. So in the Hebrew Bible, it's just one volume. Right. For us, we split it in two, I guess, because of the size, right? Mm-hmm. But, um, but this shows us how God's going to fix the problems that were laid out in Judges. Awesome. How's he going to resolve some of that tension? Right. So how's the book structured? We always talk about that. Yeah. So the first, the first seven chapters show us God's victory. So it's the rise of the prophet Samuel and uh, God versus the Philistines. Mm-hmm. Great little section on God and his power and his ability to be the king right. that the Israelites need. But in chapter 8 through 12, we see the story of the people's king. So there's a turning point, which is the people, even though God's proven his victory, right. his strength, they say, we need a, a king like the nation. Give us a king. We want a king. Yeah. Yeah. And not just any king. We want a king like the nations, right. and that is Saul. Okay, that's what you want. <laughs> God's going to give it to you. And so they get that. And, uh, and then in chapters 13 to 15, we see Saul's failure. He's rejected by God. And then in the second half of the book, in verses 16 to 18, we see David, his rise. Mm-hmm. So his rise in terms of being anointed as king, fighting Goliath, all these important stories. And at the end of the book, from 19 to 31, we see Saul's unraveling. Mm-hmm. Saul gets worse and worse and worse while David's character is being revealed step by step. And so yeah. we see this exchange happening from Saul losing power to David coming into power. Yeah, amen. So, yeah, very, very interesting book. Well, we have a lot to get to, so let's yeah. jump into it. Chapter 1. Yeah, so we're going to cover the first the first half today. We see in chapters 1 to 7, God's victory, and he, his victory is happening through the story of Samuel. Mm-hmm. So Samuel is um, is born in the first chapter, and, uh, and really the story starts in Shiloh, which kind of reminds us of the end of the book of Judges mm-hmm. when they're taking wives from Shiloh. Not a very good event. <laughs> right. But, uh, but here there's a connection back to those past failures, and, and God is redeeming Israel, and he's going to bring a, a hero into the story in the, in the person of Samuel. Right. So Hannah is this woman. She's um, the, you know, one of two wives of her husband. 
and her the other wife is having a lot of kids, and Hannah doesn't have any kids. Yeah, she's barren. Yeah, yeah. Well, another pointer to the tragedy of polygamy, right? right. This is a sin, but but she's barren, and so she's she's you know praying and praying for God to give her a child, and she eventually goes to the the temple and is praying at the temple. But before that, I love this. I love this in verse verse eight, chapter one, verse eight. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? <laughs> I love this because this is like what every <laughs> husband thinks if their wife can't have kids. They're like, I'm way better than, than kids. <laughs> right? and, the, and the answer is no, no, it's, that's not true. But that's just how guys think, you know. And then in verse 11, she, she vows a vow to God that if she has a son, that she'll make him a Nazarite, right. a Nazarite. Yeah, right? so what's that? We've talked about it before. What's a Nazarite about? Yeah, so a Nazarite was back in the book of Numbers, and a Nazarite is somebody who uh, takes a special vow to God. Usually it's just for a certain time period. Mm-hmm. It's very rare for it to be for your whole life, but somebody who, who vows to follow God and show the devotion by not cutting their hair mm-hmm. at all, not drinking wine or even touching grapes or anything like that, and yeah. not touching unclean dead bodies, mm-hmm. right? So you, it's a special type of holiness, and so you have to think about this in terms of the visual here. Samson, we know his hair was very long. He was a Nazarite. Um, John the Baptist, we know his hair was very long, mm-hmm. Nazarite. But also Samuel. Mm-hmm. We forget that sometimes. Samuel right. would have been a raggedy raggedy guy as well. Looked mm-hmm. pretty crazy. So so Eli, the, the priest, sees her. Great guy. In verse Eli. 12. Eli, not a great guy. <laughs> and uh, he he thinks that she's drunk. So he, he in verse 13... He says, you know, or verse 14, he says, why are you drinking? Put your wine away. So it's kind of indicating that this, this is not going to be a very good priest. He's a bad priest. He doesn't even know someone like who's devoted to God and his praying looks like. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then she explains to him, no, no, I'm not drunk. I'm praying for his son. And so in verse 17, he blesses her. And uh, it says in verse 19, God remembered Hannah, remembered her. And he gave her a son who she named Samuel, which means God heard because she says, I've asked for him from the Lord. So God's mm-hmm. heard her. And she's committed this son not just to be a Nazarite, but to be a servant in the temple. Right. So that, that was her that was her pledge to God, her vow to God, was that she was going to devote him to service in the temple. And so that's what she does. In verse 22, it says when, when the, the, the son was weaned, when Samuel was weaned, so that means he's, you know, eating solid foods. He's not not on the breast milk anymore. Yeah. How old was um, that in this time? Is there a, I mean. Yeah. I mean, you have to assume it's at least like two. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could have been, you know, quite a bit older. But, I mean, you probably no no older than like five. Yeah. So you got you got a preschooler. I always think this is so funny, right? So you bring this ratty-haired little dude, mm-hmm. right, into. <laughs> he doesn't cut his hair. A little surfer kid. <laughs> yeah. Into the temple. And you're like, here you go. And they're like. Oh great, a toddler, just what we wanted. <laughs> Yay. I, I don't I always think it'd be funny what if he's like trying to sneak into the holy of holies. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, is this really a helpful thing to have like a, a three or four year old right. hanging out? I anyway. But maybe they have leashes and dog collars for him. Or her intentions like are good and yeah. they apparently take the kid in. So Yeah, amen. Amen. So and then we have this we have this prayer from Hannah though. What's that all about? Yeah, so it's, so it's sort of this prayer or this song in chapter two. And this is, you know, one of the only times in, when a piece of scripture in, in the Bible is composed by a woman, and it's a really a very important text because it sets the agenda for the book of Samuel. Mm. In fact, at the end of Second Samuel, which we know is one book, there's a a prayer, a psalm written by David that reflects some of the same themes mm. as Hannah's psalm. So it's it's very interesting. And so she makes really some big statements about God in this passage. Right? She says in verse two, "There's none like God." The uniqueness of God is going to be light. Is going to be emphasized in this book, big time. We see in verses seven to eight this idea of He's exalting the poor. He's taking those who are lowly, and He's He's rising them up to mm. be leaders. Yeah, and that's a big theme in the book of Samuel because Saul and David are are both men who come from obscurity to become king over Israel. Right. So God, the fact that He can do, He can lift up whoever He wants. He can bring low whoever He wants is a big theme. And then of course, verse nine, He talks about. She talks about how he will guard the feet of his faithful one. So she's, he's going to protect those who are his. 
And this points to the rejection of Saul and the rise of David. Hmm. Throughout this story, God's going to protect David from the schemes of Saul again and again. Right. And so we see this is in the character of God. And then finally in verse 10, we see the prophecy of a messianic king. Mm -hmm. She says, The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So that word anointed, whenever you see that in the scripture, anointed, that's the word Mashiach in Hebrew. Uh, We would say Messiah in the New Testament, Christ. So this is pointing to a person who is literally anointed for, for a special task, but it increasingly refers to the um, the messianic king, hmm. or the one who is king over Israel, and eventually it points to a future person who will fulfill the purpose of that role, to be the chosen one, the anointed one, the king over Israel. Yeah, amen. So the story ends off on that note on chapter, or about halfway through chapter 2, and then it goes into the like, character of Eli and his family. What's what's this Eli guy all about? We get to learn some interesting things about him. In yeah, so, yeah, so Eli is the high priest, right? And Eli's, it says in verse 12, Eli, the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Yeah. So Eli's sons are the priests, mm-hmm. and you have it said of the priests that they are, one, worthless, and they, two, <laughs> do not know God. So this is a problem, right? If, if, like, you could say of the priest, right? Like, you have one job, right? You have essentially one job, which is to know God, <laughs> in order to connect him with other people, right? And they don't, right? So these are bad dudes. Well, why are they so bad? Well, we see how bad they are in verse fifteen. Well, what happened is before the the meat was before the, the meat was properly sacrificed, before the fat was taken off to be given as a sacrifice to the Lord, the priests would come along, the sons would come along, and stick their, the fork in there, pull out the meat, and take the best parts of it for themselves. Mm-hmm. So, the, so if you remember that very important verse we saw in Leviticus 3.16. Very important. Very important verse, <laughs> which is that the fat is the Lord's. All the fat is the Lord's. So in the meat, the best parts, the fat parts, the, um, were given to God. And instead, these guys are taking it out to take the best for themselves. Right. It totally undermines the entire purpose of the, the priesthood, which is yeah. to give the best to God. And yeah. then they would bully the people. In verse 16, we see if, if somebody said, hey, no, you got to do it the right way, they would basically bully them mm-hmm. into giving it to them. And then yeah, later we, we see that they're, that they're sleeping with the women who served at the temple mm-hmm. in verse 22. These are, these, are, these are bad guys, right? And Eli knows this, right? In verse 23, <laughs> he says, why do, you, why do you do such things? For I hear of your de- evil dealings from all these people. And then he basically says, if you don't do this, God's going God's gonna to kill you. And they wouldn't listen to their father. Hmm. So I, I, I do think Eli is totally a weenie well, of a dad. I, I do remember something about you know, uh, the law about if your sons are disobedient, you take them out and stone them. <laughs> so, <laughs> these guys, um, <laughs> yeah, these guys should be, should be stoned for sure. Um, yeah. That's crazy. So we see this contrast, though, with Samuel. So these guys are really bad, mm-hmm. and God's actually going to put them to death. He's going to, t- he's going to remove this priestly line and bring in a, a different priestly line because yeah. of how evil they are. And then in verse 26, we see, by contrast, Samuel, who's, who's growing up in the midst of this. I mean, Samuel's growing up in, the, in, in a household, right? Because this is his like adopted family. Mm-hmm. His mom gave him to these guys, yeah. and he's surrounded by this wickedness. And it says in verse 26, the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with God and also with man. Yeah. So he's being honored. He's being faithful to God. And uh, Eli and his family are not. Then we have this little, this, this man of God appears at the end of chapter 2. Mm-hmm. He appears to confront Eli to say, God's going to kill you and your family, <laughs> right? Um Verse 29, he says, why are you taking the, the fat portions? Why are you not giving the best to God? Um, we can see, actually, that Eli is part of the problem. So his sons are taking the best of the meat, and Eli is going, oh, why are you doing that? Don't do that. But then we see that Eli is very fat. Yeah. So he's, when he dies, it's, it says he's very heavy. Mm-hmm. So in other words, I mean, he was partaking of the fat portions as well. Right. He was taking the best to himself as well. He just was acting like he wasn't part of the problem. but So he's confronted, and the, the prophet or this man of God says, verse 31, your, your, your house is going to be cut off because of this. And verse 35, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest mm-hmm. who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. 
and I will build him a sure house, and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. So God's going to get a, a real high priest. But we see in this first section that God, there needs to be a true high priest, a good high priest, mm-hmm. and Israel's still lacking that. Right. And chapter 3 rolls around. Yes. Chapter 3, we see God calling Samuel. So God's word is going to be through Samuel now. Mm-hmm. So we have this you know, back and forth with God and Samuel where Samuel thinks that Eli is calling him when he hears God's voice. And right. eventually Samuel or Eli says, when, when you hear the voice say, speak, Lord, for your servant listens. So you see that actually Eli understands that when God speaks to you, you need to recognize it. You need to listen to it, respond to it. Right. He just never does that himself. Right? <laughs> so he's able to give that advice to others, but he doesn't do it himself. And so what we see is God gives a prophecy to Samuel mm-hmm. in verse 17, um, or yeah, in, 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 that, in that section. And, and what we see is basically he says, Eli's house is going to die, mm-hmm. right? Um, uh, sorry, in, in verse 17, Eli asks him what the prophecy is, mm-hmm. which is super awkward, right? right? But he, he eventually tells priest, him, yeah. Samuel tells him, God's going to kill your family because of your <laughs> disobedience. And Eli's response in verse 18 says, it is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think that's a great answer. You should probably <laughs> repent. And But anyway, so, so Eli is just a, a disaster. And now God's going to be speaking through Samuel. So God's going to protect true worship and revelation through Samuel. Samuel's right. a very important figure. Right. And really, Samuel is kind of a transitional figure between the judges and the prophets. Right. He's sort of the last of the judges because he does have sort of a ruling uh, capacity before Saul, mm-hmm. and he's the first of the prophets who work to confront the kings. They're sort of the, the uh, supreme court mm-hmm. of the land of Israel. And so Samuel kind of plays both those roles. Yeah, yeah, because Eli is also a judge, and Samuel is as well, right? Yeah. So. And then we have some fun stuff. What happens to the ark? Chapter 4, what happens is the the Israelites are fighting a battle. They're losing against mm-hmm. their great enemy, the Philistines. Mm-hmm. And so they decide to bring out the ark, right? <laughs> why not? Why don't we take the, this God you know, and, and use him in our battles? So they, they bring out the ark and use it as a tool. Right. And what happens is the ark is captured. Yeah. So we well, see, yeah. The Philistines were scared at first. Yeah. You know? They were scared. They thought, you know, they thought that, you know, the God of Israel worked like their gods. They thought they could use them for certain purposes. Right. But they end up taking the ark and killing Eli's two sons. Right. Just as had been prophesied. And in verse 13 of chapter 4, we see that Eli was sitting on on his seat by the road watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. Hmm. So he's not worried about his sons (laughs) who are at war. He's worried about the ark. I don't don't think Eli really liked his sons much. Yeah. But he understands that this is a big deal. And in verse 17, it says... That, you know, he, he asked someone, he asked the messenger, how did the battle go? And they said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there's been a great defeat. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the Ark of God has been captured. Bummer. Verse 18, as soon as he mentioned the Ark of God, mm-hmm. not the sons, the sons, no big deal, but right. you mentioned the Ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for the man was old and heavy. Hmm. So he's a, he's a fat priest. And he dies uh, a death that is, I guess, just. Right. He dies because of that. So he loses his, his children. Uh, he's dishonored God. And and so we see this defeat. It's, I mean, it's a horrible defeat. Right. The ark is lost. There's a baby born um, to Phineas, the, the deceased, and the, his name is Ichabod, right, which is the glorious departed. So, I mean, this is such a big deal. The ark of God is gone. How could Israel ever recover from this? Right. But what we see in chapter 5 is that God goes to war. Yeah, without, he, without Israel. <laughs> yeah, he goes to war by himself. And so the Philistines take the ark. They put it before Dagon, their god. This is a symbol of subservience, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, look, the god of Israel, his symbol is before our god. And the next morning they came out and Dagon had fallen on his face before the ark of God. Yeah. So he was prostrate. He was worshiping or you know showing subservience to God. So they pick him back up. They put him back up. And the next day they come in and he's fallen down again. And now his head and his hands are chopped off. Yep. So God has decapacitated it and incapacitated their God. And so they, what happens is basically it's kind of like a pinball uh, around the Philistine territories, right. <laughs> taking the ark and putting him in different places because the ark <laughs> is leading to terrible diseases. Yeah, disease. The destruction of their their idols. Yeah, their so they're, so they're yeah. The, so every time they would go somewhere, 
people there would get these tumors. And so they'd say, oh, send it to, from, you know, from Ashdod to Gath, from Gath to Ekron, all these different places in the plains mm-hmm. of the Philistines. And God is just wrecking them. Right? Right. He's bringing plagues, just like he did in Egypt. He's bringing plagues and panic in these cities. Right. And so um, we see that they're defeated, right? And they realize that. They said in verse 11, it says, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place that it may not kill us and our people. Hmm. There was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. So God is victorious with or without his people. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great. Why, like, so the question is, like, you know, the ark was with Israel. They were defeated. Ark was taken. Why didn't God just do something like this when, and during that first battle with the Philistines? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I, I think what's happening here is that God doesn't want to be used. So God's going to win the victory, but he wants his people to know you can't just bring out, you can't just bring me out to win a battle. Right. Like, you, I, I don't serve you, you serve me. Mm-hmm. So I'll have the victory, but it'll be on my terms, in my timing, and you need to obey me. Right. If you want to partake in that victory. Right. And Israel still hasn't learned that lesson. So, mm. so we see it in chapter six, they actually return, they return the ark to Israel. Mm-hmm. And, they, and they make five gold tumors and five mice. It's kind of their way of depicting the curse on them, right. the five cities that they went to uh, through these images is their way of kind of trying to atone for their sins. Um, and then what happens in verse 7 is they take two milk cows on which a, a yoke has never come, right, mm-hmm. and basically send them in a direction opposite their calves. Hmm. So you have two untrained cows pulling a cart. Wouldn't really work. And not only that, but they're going away from their young. Right. So the natural natural instinct would be for those milk cows to turn around and go back to their calves. Right. But we see this, you know, kind of minor miracle, which is that the cart is taken with the Ark of God directly to Israel. Mm-hmm. And so the Philistine lords say, "This is obviously of God." Right. Right. So the Ark is returned. God is victorious, and this is a reminder that God is the true King. Mm-hmm. That He's one that they can yeah, trust exactly. in, and they should have, they should have realized that lesson. Yeah, I mean, obviously, like we have our own depraved minds, and we do similar things, you know, equivalent things, and not trusting God. But it's it's so crazy to read this and see the power of God. Like, think of all the things that God has done already up in the Bible yeah. up to this point, and people still don't trust Him. So that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So then we get into the next section, which is the rise of Saul, mm-hmm. right? The, the people's king, right? The king that they wanted, and yep. in chapter eight, they demand a king. Which is not, it doesn't seem like that's a bad thing at first because we've already seen from Deuteronomy 17, this law of kings. Right. Moses said that when you go into the promised land, there, you'll eventually have a king. Mm-hmm. So they, they knew this. This is part of their, part of the word of Moses to them. So why was this so bad? Well, we see why it's so bad because in verse 4 of chapter 8, the elders gathered together and come, came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Yeah, like the nations. Yep. So they, they think, okay, Samuel, you're going to die. Your sons are not godly like you. Right. So there's no dynasty there. Um, and they're kind of acting like the word of God is going to end with Samuel, mm-hmm. which is really sad. But not only that, but they want a king like the nations. Hmm. They want a king that resembles what the nations have. Right. Instead of trusting that God as their king, the one who just won these victories single-handedly, that he can rule them, <laughs> that he can lead them in his timing. And so they demand this. Verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but have rejected me from being king over them. So he understands that God's saying, basically, this, this is a rejection of my rule and my leadership. This right. is a, it's a terrible sin, and it's going to lead to terrible consequences. So in verses 10 and following, uh, Samuel warns them, about what having a king will mean. He right. gives this speech about, it's going to be terrible to have a king. Mm-hmm. It's, and, and, a, and at the end, they're like, yeah, sounds good. right?" <laughs> uh, my favorite part, though, my favorite part of this whole list of things that the kings will do is verse 15. Mm-hmm. He says, he will take the tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. <laughs> so he's like, you want to know how bad this king is going to be? He's going to tax you 10%. Ooh, right? Everyone's like, oh, no. He's going to tax you as much as God himself asks of you. 
which I, I just think it's funny because we are like sales tax in Santa Cruz is 10%. Right. You know? right. It's like, no, I don't no. even know how much, you know, we're paying it after all the different things we taxed on. But <laughs> anyway, so he warns them and they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. Right. We'll do that. And they get what they asked for. Mm-hmm. So Saul, Saul appears in chapter nine. Saul is funny. It's what's emphasized about Saul is his physical appearance. So chapter nine, verses one and two. Yeah. Um, or we see, yeah, verse two. He says, super handsome. There was a man named Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So, I mean, that's that's very tall. He, you know, head, head and shoulders right. above. So everyone was pretty shrimpy to him. <laughs> and he's, in chapter nine, he's lost his donkeys. So he's not, so this is a problem because it shows kind of he's not a very good shepherd. He's not taking care of what's in, in his charge, but he's looking for these these donkeys. This will be kind of important later, but and then in chapter ten, he's anointed by Samuel. Mm-hmm. He's anointed king, and he's presented before the people in this glorious, triumphant you know moment. Well, really, it's it's kind of funny because Samuel starts off by saying, verse nineteen of chapter ten, he says, "But today you have rejected your God." <laughs> Um, so, okay, that's what you're going to get. You've rejected God, this is what you're going to get. So Saul was anointed because he looked good. Is that what I'm saying here? Yeah, well, he's he's the king like the nations. Yeah. He's tall, he's so. strong, yeah. he's a warrior, he's good looking. He's yeah. everything that you could want in a king, right? right? Yeah. I mean, how many times have you heard somebody voted for a, a, a person for office because they looked good? It happens today, man. It's, yeah. it's absolutely nuts, but it happens. <laughs> if that's you, if you're listening to this, shame on you. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but anyway, so we see we see uh, Samuel, you know, pointing Saul, and the moment the big reveal comes, right? Mm-hmm. And they can't find Saul. What the heck? And so they're looking for him. And it turns out they re- inquired, verse twenty-two, and the Lord said, "Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage." <laughs> <laughs> so he's hiding in the midst of the baggage to not be brought forward. Right. It's it's kind of a pathetic moment. Yep. And in, in verse 23, right, they, they ran and took him from there. And when he stood on the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulder upward. And Samuel said to all the people, do you see whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. Mm. And they shouted, long live the king, right? This is, <laughs> this is a great moment. We finally have the king that we need. And at first, Saul does a good job. Right. He leads them in victory at Jabesh Gilead. Jabesh Gilead, which was important for Saul because Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin. Right. And Jabesh Gilead was that one of those cities where wives were brought for the the men of, of Benjamin and judges, right? So Jabesh Gilead is probably where his mom is from, mm. if, you know, if you do think about it that way. And so Saul leads them uh, in a victory, kind of like the book of Judges, right? right? He leads them in this great victory, but it's very short-lived. Yeah, it's, I mean, he, his kind of outcome is almost like the judges. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, he's still kind of in that vein. Yeah, absolutely. So he's, he's a tragic character. Yeah. So the last section we're going to look at today is chapters 13 to 15, which is Saul's failure, Yeah, Saul's failure. So in chapter 13, we see Saul is fighting. He's working this victory for Israel over, um, o- over the Philistines. And then in chapter 13, he's, he has to make a sacrifice. So he's at Gilgal. He's waiting for Samuel to come to do what his role is, which is to make the sacrifice. And Saul's getting nervous because the people are kind of getting restless Mm -hmm. after a week of being there and no Samuel. And so he decides to make the sacrifice himself. Mm. He acts in a foolish way that shows that he's also trying to use God for his own purposes. And he's confronted by, by Samuel. And so in verses 13 and 14, Samuel says to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you, for, when, for then the Lord would have established your, your kingdom over Israel forever. Mm. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. So the problem with Saul is his heart. He's not following God. He's an obedient. With his heart, yeah. yeah. And so he's rebuked by, by Samuel. This happens again in chapter 15. Mm-hmm. Right, Samuel again has to confront him, and this time, so we see chapter fourteen. There's a lot of you know the battles of Saul. We see some of the the rashness, the foolishness of Saul, but in chapter fifteen, we see the the clear rejection of Saul. Right, 
And what happens is he goes to fight against the Amalekites. This is a people under the ban, so when he fights them, he's supposed to eradicate those who are in this city, including the king of the Amalekites. Mm -hmm. And instead, he decides to spare. He spares, spares the king. He spares some of the animals. He's supposed to just eradicate all of it. And Saul is very, very upset. So in verse 3 of chapter 15, he says, Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So very harsh command, but you know, reminiscent of what we saw in the book of Joshua. We explained it in that video, obviously, kind of what's going on there. But he doesn't, right? Verse 11, uh, the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret that I have made Saul king, mm -hmm. for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And so God turns from having Saul as king. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. This regret is its not an emotional thing for God as much as it is a, okay, I'm now going to reject Saul right. and bring in someone else to take his place. Yeah, And so that's what he does. And so Sam Samuel confronts him, and he says... Uh, he says, verse 19, he says, why did, you, why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what is evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul tries to make an argument that, well, I, I wanted to make an offering to God. Right? <laughs> so, so Samuel rebukes him, right? I mean, right. we can do this. We can, we can say, well, I know God tells me to do this or that, but if I disobey him, like, I know God says not to be greedy, but if I'm greedy... And if I cheat people and stuff like that, I can then give money to do good things. Right. And that's kind of what it's kind of what San, San, yeah. San, all Saul's doing here, right? Which is very selfish. Obviously, God's in control of all money everywhere already. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And so the answer of, of Samuel is great. In verse 22, he says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Yeah. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. Hmm. For rebellion is as, as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Wow. So, I mean, just a lot of stuff going on here, but one of the biggest things that we saw in Deuteronomy 17, the law of the kings, was the importance of the kings staying true to God's word. Yeah, reading it. Yeah. Yeah. Reading it, yeah. knowing it, right? Writing it and living by it. Right. And here, Saul is showing that his rule is not determined by what God says, right? but by what he wants. right? So his heart is not in line with God. Right. This is the king that Israel chose. Yeah. So, so I mean, big lesson for us, right, of, of the importance of listening to God's word. Mm. I just think so often, as we've talked about in the book of Genesis, right, when the serpent says, did God actually say? Mm. We question God's word. We put ourselves to uh, over God's word as the judge, right? And then we determine what we want to follow instead of opening it up and saying, "God, you get to determine uh, how I see these issues, how I respond." Right. Uh, I'm going to obey you. Right. No, we think that from our perspective, we're smarter and better than God. That's what Saul did. So. Right. Well, let's not do that. But no. let's look at the gospel connection. How does how is the good news of Jesus Christ seen in this story so far? Oh, yeah, I mean, so we see, obviously, the, the, this theme of miracle births. Yeah, it's a whisper Hannah. of what's happened before. Yeah, yeah so we saw yeah. that with, it, it's funny, actually, really, Hannah's, the Hannah story kind of sounds a lot like um, uh, Samson's story, right? Samuel and mm -hmm. Samson, kind of, their stories kind of line up. Right. You have a similar intro to their stories. They're both Nazarites, um, both got raggedy hair and all that. But Samuel actually has a much better ending. <laughs> and, and really, they, they all point to, the coming of Jesus in the most miraculous birth, right. which is the birth of, by a virgin. So we've seen that theme. Right. There's obviously a big theme in the story of, of Eli. Mm -hmm. We spent a lot of time on the story of Eli because this matters a lot in the history of God's people, which is the, the inadequacy of these human uh, mediators. Yeah, these human priests. Yeah. yeah, I mean, guys that are that see the ministry as a way to take something from people instead of giving them God's word, um, connecting them to the living God. These guys mm -hmm. are wanting the best for themselves. Yeah. So it, the abuse of the ministry is a it's a huge theme in the Old Testament and the New Testament, really. Oh yeah. Right? When you get to the Pharisees and all that, I mean, 
Well, I mean, you see, you see the same role of pastor abused today in the similar ways, right? Yeah. Obviously, like our high priest is found in Jesus. Go read Hebrews, right? But yeah. yeah. Preachers and sneakers. Preachers and sneakers, baby. Today, yeah. Go follow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't own any multi-thousand dollar sneakers, but I'm just, you know. Maybe we should get some. Just swing it on that. Is it a blatant sin? I don't know. I don't know if it's a blatant Probably sin. Probably a blatant sin, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, you think so? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, but but yeah, the big we, thing though with First Samuel, big gospel connection. The, yeah, obviously the big one is that Jesus is the the King that we need. Right. So sure, he's he's the high priest. That's a big theme. But probably the bigger theme we see in the book of Samuel is Jesus is that King. And don't get don't get tired of this theme because it's such an important one. Oh, we'll follow it for a while. That yeah. that Jesus is the one who is true to God's word. Mm-hmm. Right, Saul fails because he's not obedient. Mm-hmm. It is so important that uh, the priest and the king be obedient to God, and yet no king will ever be that. So we're going to see that more next week as well, yeah. and we're going to see it in, in in certain details. But that theme has been building, yeah. and we're seeing that even the best. I mean, S- S- Saul is the best humans have to offer. Mm-hmm. That's the idea, right? He is the best that we can do. He is strong. He is powerful. He's a warrior. And yet his heart is not right with God, and therefore he fails. Right. Yeah, there's no doubt that how Jesus came to earth in his kingly ministry, there, there's mystery to it, right? There, there was mystery here for looking forward. You know, there's a miraculousness about it that's amazing that God's gracious and would, would send his son in that way, to send his king in that way that he did with Jesus Christ. But the fact that we need a different king than earthly kings is is it's kind of not a mystery. Like God's been very clear that you need a better king than a human king since Adam, right? Yeah. Like he's been telling the same stories like, okay, and showing his power as the one ruler that humans need as God himself, not something else. And so it's kind of funny how obvious it is that that man is not going to be able to rule himself well, but we keep going back to that, right? Yeah. And it's amazing that God needs to take so much time to reinforce these lessons. That's what he's doing through the Mm. story is he's showing them again and again in every different way how inadequate human effort is Mm. and how adequate God's power is. Right. Right. He can conquer by himself. Yep. He can do it all alone. He does not need you. Right. And yet we constantly are looking to human governments, human power to accomplish what only God can accomplish. Yeah. And so Jesus is the greatest picture of that because he accomplishes everything mm. that we need. Well, amen to that. Let's believe in Jesus and trust in him. Um, that's all we got for today. We'll uh, tackle the next half of this book uh, next week. So come join us for Daily Gospel. Um, we hope it's been edifying and uh, equipping you to know God through his word and his son, Jesus Christ.